My name's Joe Bergera. I'm the president and CEO of ITERIS. We're uh, a leading provider of smart mobility infrastructure management solutions. And I know that can be a bit of a mouthful or maybe less than intuitive to some people. So let me try to put in a little bit of context. Um, I think the best way for people to get their kind of minds around that is to consider you know, the inefficiencies or what you know, we call a terrorist friction in your daily transportation experience. And those would be you know, events such as traffic congestion and poor road maintenance, maybe a late bus or a subway. Sometimes you take a wrong turn and you know, unfortunately, sometimes you maybe even encounter an occasional accident. And so at iTerrace, we think of all of those things as examples of friction in our mobility infrastructure. And we're working every day at trying to eliminate you know, that friction. Um, so for example, we provide agencies with advice on how to use technology to improve the function and performance of their intersections, their arterial roads, and their highways. Um, we also provide agencies with software to alert them to real-time friction, to present you know, trend reports, uh, assist with decision support, and even predict future events. And then finally, we develop and market smart sensors that con uh, collect contextual information about really everything that is happening at an intersection. And then we digitize that information in real time. We run sophisticated algorithms against that contextual data and provide instructions to the signal controller to optimize the timing of individual traffic lights for current traffic and pedestrian conditions. And then we publish that contextual information to our cloud, which we brand as Clear Mobility Cloud. And then we um, run additional analysis against that large historical data set for further operational and strategic analysis by various agencies. So cities can really get a lens into how their cities operating and working and or not working per se. Particularly, um, of course, particularly their transportation networks, absolutely, which is a really essential pillar to any really uh, you know the operations of really any city let's talk about uh the pandemic a lit bit and technology so in your mind how has the pandemic accelerated the need for technology solutions in cities and what role do you think technology will play in post-covid recovery for cities clearly the pandemic has been um the most difficult for organizations with you know, what I would call rigid or inflexible business processes. And, you know, and, and those organizations often have underlying information architectures that are also inflexible or rigid. Um, in fact, those organizations, you know, are kind of conversely, I guess, those organizations that have been capable of virtualizing or, you know, what I'd call like replicating, some of their business processes in the cloud um, have actually navigated the pandemic quite well. And, you know, a few of them, you know, notable ones have even thrived. And of course, a lot of the examples that people think of are, you know, commercial entities. And obviously it's not possible for cities to provide, you know, all of their services in the cloud. Their, you know, their business models are very different from, you know, Netflix and, and Amazon, but there are a lot of services or at least backend processes that could better, those city services or backend processes that could better leverage cloud technologies. And I think COVID has demonstrated that cloud-based services are actually more agile, resilient, and efficient than many traditional agency business processes. So as a result of COVID, I think that most public agencies, really at all levels of government, are going to, over time, recognize that they have to accelerate their cloud-first strategies. To the next kind of recovery question, how do you think cities can get their ducks in a row to be ready for this new infusion of infrastructure, transportation, and other, other federal funds that are slated to come down to cities? Yeah, well, um, so first of all, I don't think we can, you know, count our chickens before they hatch. There's obviously a lot of machinations that still need to occur, particularly in Washington. But, you know, hopefully, um, you know, the 
Congress will come together to support such an initiative, which I, I, I you know, I obviously think is critical. Um, so assuming that that occurs, um, you know, I believe that the, really the key issue for cities will be to you know, figure out how to balance or focus on strategic objectives, which tend to imply long-term payback because they're strategic, with more tactical objectives that, you know, because they're tactical tend to yield shorter term paybacks. And um, I want to be <clears throat> very clear that I think that it's really important for agencies uh, at all levels of government to pursue, um, you know, critical strategic priorities such as, you know, carbon emissions. And I, and I absolutely hope the cities will take on those types of initiatives. However, you know, that being said, I think that the American public, you know, desperately needs reassurance, especially right now, that public agencies can deliver on their missions and positively impact quality of life. So therefore, I think it's really essential that a substantial portion of any investments should be directed to initiatives that are well understood, mm -hmm. that are relatively low risk, and that are able to produce tangible public value in the short term. Um, so to answer your question, I'd encourage cities to begin to characterize you know, the potential opportunities in front of them so that they're you know, prepared to discuss the inevitable trade-offs that you know are gonna be there and then prioritize their investment initiatives in you know, what I think would be a well-considered in a timely manner. Again, seeking to balance the need for you know, longer-term strategic priorities with this you know, really um, essential need to show value now um, people are desperately looking for that. We all know technology moves at a much more rapid rate than government can keep up with. We're seeing this with vaccine distribution, for instance, right now. But what insights do you have for how government can operate and implement more quickly across multiple technical environments that you work in? So similar to my earlier comments, I, I, I think the cities need to embrace a cloud-first strategy. Um, you know, in some cases, actually, frankly, probably in many cases, cities have been pretty slow to adopt uh, their cloud in, in many instances because they feared that the cloud was you know, somehow less robust or maybe more vulnerable than their on-premise architectures. However, you know, the pandemic, I think, has really demonstrated the superior agility, the extensibility, and, and I think first and foremost, really the resiliency of cloud architectures and, you know, further the adoption of cloud architectures, somewhat contrary to what I think people at least initially thought, um, you know, can actually help agencies overcome critical security threats in their own architectures by transitioning to a more distributed computing model and also by leveraging the cybersecurity expertise of cloud service providers. Mm -hmm. And you know, that being said, you know, it's, it's not that easy. It's not like you just flip a switch and you move to the cloud. It'll take you know, most agencies several years to transition you know, a significant portion of their information architecture to the cloud. Um, but I think it's something that people need to get on. And you know, I, I also, I, I guess I would say that you know, many agencies, and I think particularly at the city level, you know, will want or need to add some internal expertise, or they're going to have to partner with technology advisors to help them navigate you know, what I think are going to be some you know, complex decisions related to such a transition. But I do think it's essential that you know, people move in that direction. Do you think cities that position would be inside like a, a chief data officer's or CIO or CTO's office? Yeah, so that's definitely a trend that we're seeing um, in the transportation um, vertical, if you will. A lot of the technology decisions were made by the traffic engineering um, department. And you know, as people begin to transition to the cloud, you know, we're seeing that the CIO or a chief data officer will get more and more involved in some of the decision making. That adds some complexity, in some cases slows things down, 
And as I said, I think it's really essential that agencies move quickly, particularly right now. So that's another thing that needs to be balanced. But you know, overall, I think that you know that um, the collaboration between the IT organization and the you know, transportation um, functions is essential. And you know, over the long term, I think that's going to prove to be beneficial to everyone. So I would mm -hmm. definitely encourage that type of um, interaction. Small and medium-sized cities, a lot of times, don't have a chief data officer, CIO, CTO's office. So in those instances, and maybe you've worked in some of these small and medium-sized cities, is would you recommend outsourcing that work to a cloud service with cybersecurity expertise so that they don't have to bring that in-house? Yeah, well, that's where I would recommend trying to find some type of a partner. And you could rely on a cloud service provider, but um, I think it'd be preferable to try to find um, sort of an independent advisor, you know, who could recommend um, uh, essentially um, uh, a, a roadmap for an agency to make that transition. And, you know, I think that most agencies are going to find that they'll want to standardize a lot of their activities on a particular cloud service provider, but I doubt that there will ever be one that will be able to address, you know, the full breadth of their requirements. And that's where I think an independent advisor can give the city a recommendation on, you know, what's the right collection of cloud service providers and how do the various services, you know, interact or interoperate optimally. And I don't, it, I mean, this stuff is complex, but it's not rocket science. And so I think that you'd be able to, you know, typically a city could find someone, you know, who would be either a local or a regional service provider with sufficient expertise to navigate these types of decisions. What are you working on right now that you think could play a key role in combating a surge in road usage, congestion, and road fatalities that we've been seeing over as the pandemic continues on. <laughs> yeah, and it seems to just continue and continue and continue, <laughs> but I'm sure we will get to the other side. And uh, so I think it's a really interesting question. And um, actually, I, I think we have a pretty good example. Probably our best example is um, ClearGuide. Um, ClearGuide is a SaaS-based uh, solution. More specifically, it's a, a SaaS-based mobility intelligence solution that analyzes um, large amounts of complex transportation data to produce real-time and historical visualizations that help agencies optimize their transportation networks. And um, interestingly, over the course of the COVID pandemic, you know, several cities and states have been using ClearGuide in really innovative and interesting ways to monitor the impact of changing social distancing guidelines on traffic volume, traffic safety, you know, congestion. Um, and by uh, doing that analysis, it's helped agencies um, find interesting ways to reallocate resources. In some instances, we found agencies have actually accelerated uh, transportation initiatives, the things that involved construction with you know, traffic being traffic volume being less than um, uh, typical, it's been in that sense sort of an ideal environment to accelerate certain activities that would otherwise be highly disruptive. And then we've seen in other cases where um, due to a decrease in um, uh, traffic volumes and then associated workflow, agencies or cities, I guess, have really been able to reallocate some resources from transportation-related activities to other response-related efforts. And, you know, so we've been, you know, delighted to see that as well. So anyway, as the um, we continue to navigate this pandemic, which I think is going to, you know, be with us, unfortunately, for several more months to come, you know, we'll continue to make enhancements to ClearGuide, you know, as we always would. And, you know, we expect ClearGuide to be able to support critical planning activities. But to get back to, you know, your original question, as we begin to emerge from COVID, you know, we hope that agencies will use, continue to use ClearGuide to develop and execute their renormalization plans yeah. um, so that they have the right resources in place um, as we do get back to normal, which we will.
Well, is there anything else we didn't cover? Any projects that you're working on that you wanted to inject in here? <laughs> well, um, I guess one other thing that we're working on that is particularly interesting, um, and which uh, you know might might be of benefit to some of your listeners is um, some work that we're doing um, in this area of near miss uh, analysis. And that's where we're um, uh, again ingesting uh, data, particularly intersection um, related uh, data and applying artificial intelligence against that to understand um, certain locations and certain types of scenarios that are indicative of um, actual accidents or near accidents so that agencies can take um, preventive measures to um, forestall uh, a, you know future accidents and so I think this is a super interesting um, uh, area in the transportation field it's super interesting um, application of artificial intelligence and so um, you know, something that I, I hope that will prove to be successful and ultimately can contribute to moving the industry towards our collective objective of um, vision zero. Yeah, well, we really need that right now. I know New York City has seen more pedestrian fatalities this past year than in, I'm not sure what the number is, but it's been it's been quite bad. Is that the kind of data you're seeing too for given everyone's out doing their daily walks? Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think it's a combination of, you know, many things. I, you know, distracted driving has been on the increase, you know, for some time. And unfortunately, I think that that's going to, you know, continue unabated. And, um, you know, and I, I don't have any data on this, but I just have to say in my own personal life, I feel that people are, you know, really distracted. And in some cases, you know, I think that, um, you know, COVID has just really taken a toll on people and um, it it just, you know, unfortunately I see instances where there's like, you know, a higher degree of, you know, angst and, and aggression. And, you know, you see that really in many, many, you know, play out in many, many different ways, including, you know, on the roads. And so, yeah, I think it's, you know, there there are people trying to just get out and clear their head and so you know you do in certain areas you're actually seeing an increase in pedestrian traffic and then you know on the other hand you're seeing continued you know high levels of distracted driving and then this you know at least in my own opinion what seems to be some kind of higher levels of aggression um yeah, at least speeding. you know beyond in, in certain isolated instances perhaps but still it's it's something to be thoughtful about Right. And road safety has been a vision zero has been a priority for a lot of cities for a long time. But the new technology solutions ITRS and others are developing can really help us try to yeah, address something that those. We, absolutely something that we desperately need to get to. And, you know, and, and I do want to just say something, you know, positive on vision zero, because I think a lot of people sort of, you know, are, uh, you know, a bit bereft that, you know, we haven't made more progress, but I, I would hate to think about where we would be if it weren't for all the attention on Vision Zero. And so, you know, we'll never know, you know, what the actual real impact is, but I do believe that it is contributing positively. I think it's a noble goal and something that we should all stay focused on.